Hello, I'm Dr. Scott Wadier. And I'm Tommy Welling, and you're listening to the Fasting for Life podcast. This podcast is about using fasting as a tool to regain your health, achieve ultimate wellness, and live the life you truly deserve. Each episode is a short conversation on a single topic with immediate actionable steps. We cover everything from fat loss and health and wellness to the science of lifestyle design. We started Fasting for Life because of how fasting has transformed our lives, and we hope to share the tools that we have learned along the way. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Fasting for Life podcast. My name is Dr. Scott Wadier, and I'm here, as always, with my good friend and colleague, Tommy Welling. Good afternoon to you, sir. Hey, Scott. How are you? Doing fantastic, my friend. We're going to have a good conversation today, if I do say so myself. Uh, I want to welcome all the new listeners uh, in today. If you're new to the podcast, thanks for being here. If you guys have been with us for a while, been on this fasting journey, we appreciate you, your reviews, your feedback, your questions, your emails. Yeah. And I'm really excited about today's conversation as some of these questions have come up, you know, from you guys, the listeners, and then also some of the conversations that you and I have been having uh, with some of our long-term members where... Yeah. The basic beginner questions are different than the more advanced. I've been doing fasting for a while. I've adopted Mm -hmm. this as a lifestyle type questions. And I feel like a couple of these are going to be more in that category, but we've got some good ones that we want to unpack for you today and um, have some action steps for you as we always try to do at the end of the episode uh, to make sure that you can take this stuff and apply it to your day-to-day life. Yeah, it's, it's a really good point because as you go through your fasting journey, those questions do change. You start to pay attention. You start to realize, oh, you know what? I didn't even realize I was doing that or I was thinking that or maybe that had an effect on some way that I felt or that I think and that affects the very next fast after that. You start stringing those together and then you can start to explain why results can vary even if the fasting seems like simple and I'm doing it the same way as somebody else that I know, but our results are very different. There's a lot of reasons for that. I love using listener questions or questions that come in or things that are brought up in the groups or in the challenges or whatnot, Mm -hmm. uh, because it gives us, you know, insight. If you listen to the podcast intro, so if you've with all the catchy music, right, that I still love, I can listen to that music (laughs) on repeat. Uh, Sometimes I do. But when you know, I love that they, they they come in because this is showing like real time, like real life stuff, right? Like not mm-hmm. just, you know, sometimes we get nerdy on some episodes. And again, if you're new, there's a mix of more conversational, more life application, more sometimes we dive into the research articles and try to hit it all from different angles, but more importantly, make it conversational. In our journeys uh, with fasting and weight loss and health, there was a lot of compartmentalization and that can be good to a certain degree, but it's through the framework and the experience that we can change the outcome. And that's why I think today's questions are going to be really great because I think there's going to be some like looking at it through a different lens, so to speak. Hmm. Yeah. Good point. Where do you think we should start? I think we should start with the question, isn't OMAD or one meal a day Right. And if you're new to fasting, we have a one meal a day resource. It's the first resource that we ever created. You can go to the website, thefastingforlife.com, click resources. We'll zoom it over into your inbox. It's a six steps to put one meal a day fasting into your life. So um, didn't expect to put a plug in there right there. But OMAD came up and I was like, if people are new, they're not going to know what that is. So isn't one meal a day fasting just caloric restriction? Hmm. Yeah, it's a good point Um, because that that question right there kind of kept me from fasting for a long time where I said, I'm tracking everything. Isn't this the same? I don't need to look at the clock. I'm already counting every calorie, every macro. Right. Um, So so it must be the same. But the the missing piece there for me and for a lot of folks on the same journey was the insulin component, because there is a very different insulin effect on uh, three, four, five six meals a day or eating opportunities throughout the day, whether that was a protein shake or a prepackaged meal or something that I had prepped early in the week, even if it was extremely healthy, nutritious and calculated down to the very last calorie, there's still a significant insulin response there. And when you have an insulin response, it's not that that's a bad thing, but we have to know that that keeps us from getting into long-term fat burning mode 
and we are in energy storage mode at that point. So if we're doing one meal a day and we only have one main insulin spike throughout the day, we're able to get those insulin levels lower and keep them there longer, which tends to put us into more of the long-term fat burning mode, which uh, for many of us on the fasting journey, that's that's why we got here because we were looking to undo years of weight accumulation. At least I was. And I love it from the energy perspective too. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, personally we've experienced this and a lot of, if you guys have been fasting, you know this, that energy boost that you get, right? Mm -hmm. That, that feeling of once you get past the, you know, figuring out what cravings are and what hunger is and how to hydrate and using high salt and electrolytes and knowing, you know, you, after you get some repetitions with it, yeah. um, you can really get to a place where speaking to this question of, you know, not getting results versus getting results and being on a low caloric restriction for three to six months at a time and, you know, getting results in the short term, but then plateauing and frustration sits in and willpower mm -hmm. runs out and et cetera, et cetera. I love the idea or this concept, like you said, Tommy, that the insulin spikes, right? So the difference here is that, like you, you said, we're, we're shrinking the window when we have the elevated insulin and the excess energy in our bloodstream. So mm -hmm. if you're doing four or five, you know, uh, or six meals a day and you're, you're small spike, small spike, small spike, small spike, um, you're, and let's say you're working out five or six times a week and you've plateaued and you're just not getting the results, yeah. your body's going to go into a short term, not an energy depletion, but a state where it's going to want to try to conserve some of the limited energy that's coming in. Sure. And yeah. that's the problem with long-term caloric restriction is that you get into like everything starts to slow down and they've they've shown this and we did an episode recently on on um the difference between exercising in a fed state versus a fasted state mm -hmm. and what happens to fat burning during uh exercise fasted and then post exercise right and y there really is no uh, great benefit to either you get the same net effect because your body yeah compensates and either upregulates or downregulates the storage of energy or the expenditure of energy, right? Mm -hmm. So with that, for me, when I was on a caloric restriction and doing the workout plans and counting calories and macros, I always found that I did great for a little while, but then I would everything felt like it just slowed down and I felt more tired, more brain right. fog, yep. my sleep was worse, I was more on edge. And then when I put fasting in, you only have that one spike, and then your body's able to tap into those fat stores. And now it has this energy like rush, like yeah. just picture a dam breaking. And then you've got right. this energy that floods in. So yeah, you might have, you know, the same amount of caloric intake ac across, uh, you know, uh, four or five or six opportunities with two or three meals and some snacks versus, you know, uh, let's even say 60 or 80% of that in, in a one meal a day, or let's say, a you know, a 20 hour fast, right? With a four hour eating window, a nutrition window. And we'll talk mm -hmm. about those terms in just a second. Yeah. But the rest of that time, you're gonna get that energy like increase, that whoosh, right? And that yeah. doesn't always happen right when you start fasting, but typically it does within the first couple of weeks. Yeah, and, and to compound that problem, one thing that you mentioned there was exercise. And sometimes the issue can be that if I'm like, I was heavy into the exercise world and I grew up on protein shakes. Like I got my first like tub of protein powder when I was probably 14. And, you know, so that was like a mainstay for me, but I, I would always look at the actual calories of those and never think about the insulin response. So the problem there is I might only be taking in 150 or 200 calories worth of protein. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, well, I got this anabolic window. Um, I want to bring in this protein right now after my workout. Otherwise my workout's just going to just throw it in the garbage, right? It was just a waste of time. And then the problem is there that that insulin the insulin response from that protein shake is so disproportional to the number of calories I just brought in that that that's compounding the problem. And I could feel it like I felt different after having those, but I could never explain why that was or why the scale wasn't moving, even though everything was perfectly counted out. I had never thought about that. I used to get up super early in the morning and go do CrossFit. Mm -hmm. And this is when I was doing Mac, like years and years, right, of this. And I would get up early, I'd be rested, I'd have a good night's sleep, I'd get up, energized, I'd work out, I'd have my shake with coconut water, right? Mm -hmm. And then I would be exhausted. Right. <laughs> I would crash. Yeah. And that's probably why I still don't like working out in the morning. I should probably try it again. Uh, I'm typically a midday, late afternoon day when 
yeah. when the energy, my brain energy has been, uh, you know, used up in the morning because that's where I like my creative time, my my project completion time, my mm -hmm. my focused energy time in the mornings. And as the day goes on, it's more, you know, get stuff done, kind of task oriented stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, so I like to work out later in the day, but I was just that, that's interesting that you put it that way, because I wonder if that protein shake was co contributing to that. And I always used to feel that like insatiable hunger after it too. So I guarantee that had to do with that blood swing, that blood sugar yep. swing from that yep. insulin spike. So, so for the question, and that's why I love this question of isn't OMAD just a caloric restriction it, in, in theory? Yes. Like in definition, yes, you're restricting your calories throughout the day, sure. but the difference is in the insulin component or that hormonal component to it. And this question really went well with another question that had come in about, well, what happens uh, I love this terminology. If I cheat, if I put air quotes around the word cheat right. yeah. uh, during a fast and what kind of air quotes damage am I doing to the overall process? Oh, yeah, that's that's a loaded question right there, too. And I, I like this one because you have you have the physiological component, but you also have the psychological component here, too. And then the the long term additive effects of how how well do I feel motivated during my fast? How easy is it to stick to this fast and then set my next timer as well? If I'm looking to string together long-term fasting wins in order to see long-term results, I'm going to need to maintain good motivation and, and a good sense of, of identity throughout this process here. I'm going to need to be reaffirming the fact that I can hit a fasting timer. I can do it well. I can feel good about it. And not kick myself too much if I do make a, a mistake or quote unquote cheat or like fall off a little bit. I'm going to need to pick myself back up pretty quickly so that I can get to the next fasting timer, hit it, have the physiological benefits and and keep seeing those results over time. And I, I feel like a lot of people get derailed because of something like this right here and then don't know how to pick themselves back up and kind of get themselves remotivated or tell themselves that it's OK that was temporary or that was a mistake and it's okay. I can just set my next timer and get right back on the horse. Well, when we had this conversation with the person, it was interesting because I, I, my, one of my first questions was, well, what was, what was the reason for it? Was it insatiable hunger? Was it stress? Was it like, oh, you just felt like, man, you just had to have it like that connection mm -hmm. that emotional connection to a certain sweet treat or something. And there's a big difference between, you know, something like a handful of almonds, which at max could be 25% insulinogenic, right? Have have a 25% yeah. insulin response. You'd probably have to eat a considerable amount too. Um, or like some bone broth versus a Starbucks cookie that might have 40 mm -hmm. grams of sugar and, you know, three, 400 calories, right? right? So the physiological versus emotional damage, I put air quotes again, we're in an, we're in an audio <laughs> medium. So I just need to make sure I keep saying that because yeah. I can see you and you can see me do it. But it doesn't make sense to any of y'all listening Right, um, is different too. So the going back to, to land the plane is like, well, why, first of all, the terminology, why do you feel that it's a cheat and that there's damage and, and like, what's the, what's the intention behind it? And then you brought up a great question when we walked through it, Tommy was how does it feel after? And the answer was more like, well, it's kind of not really intentional. It's just kind of like, yeah. I'm in the moment, it's busy, I'm over here, I'm doing this, and then I do it, and I'm like, oh yeah, I did it. So in the bigger picture of things, it's pretty inconsequential to the long-term goal. So I don't see any damage to it unless it's the roadblock that you were talking to that's not allowing mm -hmm. you to get consistent with your fasting windows. Yeah, because if you're, if you're speaking about damage as in like, well how how far did I put off my goals right there? Well, it, it's just a matter of, well, how many calories did I eat? Was it like 100 calories? Okay, maybe if I'm burning a little less than 100 calories an hour, then you know maybe I did an hour or an hour and a half worth of quote unquote damage, right? Just to be like ultra simplistic about it. But, um, you know, because so, that's basically like I brought energy in, I'm gonna need to burn through that. So I, I added a little bit to my... Um, to my number of hours that I'm going to need to fast to get to my long-term, you know, weight goal. But if we're if we're talking on the psychological side of it, I'm I'm more concerned with with that side because if if I get into a like a shame guilt spiral and I if I find it like I'm I'm judging myself for my behavior and I can't really mentally move past it, 
that's going to be a problem because then it's easy to bring in more food to to help kind of like fill that gap or fill that void and bring in positive feelings from the food that I'm taking in, which makes it a slippery slope, harder to set the timer, harder to stop that behavior and set the timer for the next fast. And that can be a, a real problem. And then on my next fast, I, I, I'm looking at my, my previous fast as potentially a failure or didn't go exactly like I wanted to. And then that starts to have long-term effects on my self-image too. So uh, it, that's, that can be like a, a spiral. And this all came from the question, when I cheat during a fast, explain the extent of damage that I do, right? Yeah. So that's why we, I love the application of some of these things. So if you're listening um, and you're like, yeah, I do that. I, I, man, I was doing so great and I just can't seem to get past that, that, that sticking point, right? Mm -hmm. This is something that we talk a lot about is committing, especially during the challenges when we have these different, uh, like choose your own adventure. Are you more of a beginner? Are you more advanced? Do you want to do uh, like a super advanced schedule right during the seven days? Yeah. And then, you know, when people ask us for advice, it's like, okay, well, the, the, the question I always like to lead with is if you're in that situation and it's been the stumbling block and there's some of the things that you're feeling or resonating with some of the things that we just talked about mm -hmm. is start with something that you know you can commit to or just outside of your, your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So don't go and try to, I'm gonna do a 72 hour fast because no, you're not. And you know you're not gonna do it. <laughs> do, I'm gonna do an open-ended fast to make up for the guilt that I feel from the air quotes cheat. No, C pick something that you can commit to, go back to the basics, pull out your, your fast start guide that has mm -hmm. the six steps, right? For one meal a day. Keep um, it simple. Go back to a, a fast where you were successful recently and go recreate that because it's not just the timer sometimes. Mm -hmm. It is the sleep and the stress and the mindlessness and the connection to a certain food. It could be that stuff too. So pick something that you can absolutely commit to if you need to regain your traction coming out of something like this if you notice you've been in a funk. Yeah, take notice if, if anything's repeating itself because if you find yourself triggered to make the same quote unquote cheat, throughout the week, or maybe it's a certain day of the week or a certain week of the month. It, it could have to do with hormonal cycles, right? But it could also yeah. be contextual. Like every time I drive by a certain fast food place, I feel compelled because I have a long-term habit to, to kind of go towards it. Pick a different route, you know, to come home from work if you need to. If it's a candy bowl at work, toss it out or replace it with stuff that you really aren't tempted by. And that can be for everybody else. Like it's okay to start tweaking your environment to protect yourself from these kind of feelings and they'll get easier or they'll start to erode over time. But in the beginning, you might need some sort of shortcut to either avoid them or, or take away the temptation completely or put it into your window and avoid right. it outside of your window. Right? Yeah. That's that, that mindfulness, right? So if you're in the moment, yeah. you're grabbing the cookie, you're grabbing the thing off your kid's plate, you're the, the, the jar of candy in the, in the conference room at, at, at work, whatever it is, Put that into your window, like put, make sure you're putting that into the, the the plan that you want for sustainability. So I love that part. And yeah. I forgot that that came out in the conversation as well, where it's like, oh, yeah, well, how do I? Yeah, I don't really need to be doing this right now. Let me just save this for later. And that just a right. little bit of that delayed gratification. Um, we're working on that with my five year old daughter right now. Sure. And um, yeah. it's a it's a very powerful motivator especially at five years old, but uh, it can be also for the things that we, that we enjoy, especially when it comes to food and relationship with food as well. So yeah. I'm really glad that that came up again. Um, yeah. And it just brought me back to that conversation. So one other thing here was the, the, the question about uh, one meal a day in nutrition window, right? So mm, okay. what's the difference between one meal a day and the, let's say a, a four hour nutrition window or even um, like and a I thought one this, hour. Or right. even a even one like hour a, nutrition window, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so I, I think that that's a good question because again, it, it can come down to the insulin response, but we can also, we can also imagine that if I sat down for one meal, maybe it's 30 minutes, there's, there's time to eat a certain amount of food, right? But if I have a, a one hour or a two hour eating window, it's, it's really not the same thing because now I have the opportunity to potentially, potentially graze Maybe I can fit in um, like a smaller meal or kind of almost an appetizer in there and a full meal. So I'm, I might have three different eating opportunities just within a couple of hours. That's going to make a big difference 
uh, long term for the number of calories that I brought in during that that eating opportunity. That's gonna that's gonna add up over days and weeks and months to change the trajectory of my progress, my long term uh, weight loss goal progress. Right. Yeah, and that really the word window is the slippery slope for me, right? Because mm-hmm. that's what you just described there. The nutrition component is really just an, a push towards making better, more intentional decisions about the food that we are giving our body during the opportunity, yes. during the time restricted nature of fasting. Mm-hmm. Making sure, because we see this a lot, people plateau, they can't stick to it. It's because you're not giving yourself enough opportunity to consume nutrient dense. Mm-hmm. Uh, satiating foods that you enjoy. And that's might just no, s- go ahead. Might, sorry, might still be scared of food almost right, like from right. the calories in calories out. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that, that's that, the, the, the mindset that we want to break. Like we, we don't want to bring that stuff into fasting because that's just another diet, right? right. We don't want that. We don't want to bring that stuff in. So that's why I loved this question. Uh, one meal a day and, and she actually explained it her, herself, uh, during the conversation was like, so I'm just going to, sit down, have a meal, uh, eat till I'm satiated and then set my timer. Bingo. There's one meal a day, right? There's one meal a day. Yeah. Put some intention, enjoy it, eat slowly, hydrate throughout the day. Boom. You nailed it. Now I like the concept of nutrition window, the the window, the slippery slope portion, when we're talking about maintenance, when we're talking about a fast break, when we're talking about getting back on track or when you hit a set point and you're breaking through a plateau, giving your Mm -hmm. body the signs, it's like, Hey, we're good here. You know, maybe you've lost 20 or 30 pounds and it's stalled. Okay. Well have a window where you can get some good sustenance in there and, and give your body what it needs to know that, you know, slow down. Like the first 20 doesn't go as fast as the second 20. If you've got 40 or 50 to lose, the body is changing. Um, and that's why I love the idea of the window when it comes more to the maintenance portion of how you maintain these changes in the weight loss with fasting. Yeah, agreed. And like those first probably six to nine months on my own fasting journey, I used weeks like that where I went to a three, four, five hour window to maintain the progress on the scale because I was still just in utter disbelief that I had actually lost 20 or 25 pounds. Like it still felt like too good to be true. And I was scared that as soon as I stopped setting these 20 to 30, 36 hour timers, that I was just going to immediately like give it all back. Like I, I, I kept seeing the scale in my mind, just ticking back up just super quickly. So I would take, you know, a few days to a week here and there, open that window a little bit, be really intentional with my food, but just to gain confidence, like those confidence building weeks. And, and sometimes that's a really important part of the, the process, especially if you you find yourself looking in the mirror going, well, I'm not even sure I recognize this person right now because the change is happening relatively quickly and I, I'm not used to weight loss success. Right. Yeah. And that's that's that that just speaks to the to the long term sustainability equation. Right. Yeah. I don't want to call it the long term sustainability problem, but the long term sustainability <laughs> equation, like how do yeah. I. How do I make this stick long term? Well, it's that repeated win. And even when there is, let's call it a failure or a, the last question and a cheat, right? Like you broke a fast early or we had a question that I, I want to mention just briefly here about, is there a difference between a 30 hour fast and followed by a 24 or a 42 followed by a 12? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, my first response was, I think you're overcomplicating it, right? Yeah. If you have a lunch that comes up and you want to go eat lunch, go eat lunch and then set your timer and get back to as close to your plan as possible. Yeah. And that's where we talk about that long-term sustainability piece. Now, a 12-hour fast isn't even a fast. Okay, let's get to let's get to 16, 18 hours before we start to call anything a fast, okay? Right. Come on. Let's let's be real here, right? We can yeah. we can stop eating at 8 p.m. and not eat by 8 a.m., right? And that right. I mean that's 12 hours. Like let's yeah. <laughs> let's skip Sleeping breakfast. is not a fast, right? Yeah, let's let's make it to lunch, okay? Yeah. Um, but it does speak to that that sustainability piece long term where we want to be able to zoom out and zoom in when necessary. Yeah, that that question right there also speaks to the whole what happens if I cheated during that fast because it's a matter of well, yesterday I wasn't like perfect that word. I, I keep well, I know, right? I know That's why I keep I know. saying it. I, air and, quotes. And, yeah, air quotes cheated. But but the the thing about it is having a short memory for like what happened right. yesterday or or if I made a fasting mistake 
or if I feel like, ah, oh, man, I cheated. That was that was like the old me. That was an old habit. That's what I'm trying to get away from. OK, well, let's have a short memory for that kind of stuff. And if if yesterday I had lunch, but I, I, I hadn't planned on it yet, I planned to do a longer fast yesterday. Ruminating on yesterday is not going to help me stick to my timer today. It's not going to help me keep my eye on the prize, focus on my long term results. So let's just let's just drop it. Let's forget about it and focus on what we can do right in the moment today and set that next timer and then just keep moving forward. Yeah, I love that intention. It's it's you know, we we say this quote often as we we fail forward and mm-hmm. and you know, with a lot of my business mentor business mentorships and business mentors, they're always like the faster you can fail, the more you're going to grow because you will yeah. literally learn in those moments. So we like to talk about how we need to enjoy the process and These hiccups are not failures. In the dieting world, there's a lot of that negative reciprocal psychology that comes into play where, Mm -hmm. you know, you're on or you're off. The beautiful thing about fasting is that it's simple, even though sometimes not easy. You have the ability to just in the moment, make the decision, commit to something that you can commit to in terms of a window and and, and set the timer and go. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's the beauty of it is that it's simple. You know, for me, I don't I don't miss counting the calories, tracking the macros, I don't miss six to eight hours of meal prepping and planning on Sundays with my wife. Now, do we do plan our our week and our meals? Um, mm-hmm. But it's a much different conversation. It's, hey, when are you eating this week? Okay, here's my fasting. He said, okay, I'm going to make, we need to shop for these recipes. You're going to cook Tuesday. I cook there. Okay, boom, done. And we're done in like 20 minutes yeah. over a cup of coffee on a Sunday, <laughs> you know, versus six to eight hours. So, uh, Tommy, as we wrap up today's episode, I love the fact that, and this was not planned, but um, a lot of the com- questions that come up today and things that we've mentioned are go right back to the resources that we have uh, that we've created uh, that you can find on our website on BeFastingForLife.com. So if you need to get back on track or you want to do OMAD, you've been doing an intermittent window, you can go download the Fast Start mm-hmm. Guide, right? And um, we've mentioned insulin a lot, right? So we have a, a subjective insulin assessment that can give you, give you some insight uh, into whether or not you might have some insulin resistance, which could be contributing to that uh, long-term sustainability difficulty of getting the weight off and keeping it off. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And if you, if you find yourself at a struggle point, not sure what to do, you, you feel like groundhog day, like the same thing keeps coming up over and over again, then shoot us a message info at the fasting for life.com. Um, so that we can, we can kind of talk through it. And, yep. um, I, I feel like that conversational component can be sometimes can be all the difference between getting to that next step and seeing long-term results versus just plateauing, getting frustrated and not seeing the results that you're looking for. And ultimately saying, yeah, fasting doesn't work for me, right? Sure. Yeah. And that's that's ultimately the last thing that we want because yep. there's enough, any Barnes and Noble, go to the lifestyle section. There's enough dieting and lemon juice <laughs> diet books and, and all the other stuff out there that can right. give you those results. So we want you to get the results you've been looking for. So appreciate everybody listening, Tommy. As always, appreciate the conversation uh, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye. So you've heard today's episode and you may be wondering, where do I start? Head on over to thefastingforlife.com and sign up for our newsletter where you'll receive fasting tips and strategies to maximize results and fit fasting into your day-to-day life. While you're there, download your free Fast Start Guide to get started today. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to leave us a five-star review, and we'll be back next week with another episode of Fasting for Life.